Yes, sir. Appreciate it, Ron.
All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming out for the third in our, uh, the third lecture in our series on the scandal of holiness presented by Dr. Jessica Hooten Wilson, uh, our 2022 scholar in residence. Uh, we're very glad you're here today, uh, whether you're here in person or whether you're uh, participating online, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Scott Hewlin. I direct the honors community here at Union and i um, very pleased to serve as the host for uh, this lecture series. Uh, it's one that's been going on since uh, the year 2000, uh, despite the, the fact that it's the 24th annual and it's only 2022. <laughs> but that's because we had two years where we had two scholars in residence. So that explains how that happens. Um, if, uh, if you were here uh, at either of the previous lectures, you already know a little bit about our speaker. Uh, Dr. Jessica Hooten Wilson is a, an established scholar in the field of religion and literature, having written books on uh, Dostoevsky, Walker Percy, Solzhenitsyn. Um, and, uh, and, but in addition to that, she's also uh, somebody who's well known in the classical Christian school movement and not only helped found a classical Christian school, but is uh, active in faculty development work and family development work uh, in classical Christian schooling world uh, all around the country, a much in demand speaker in this regard, but uh, she, as I have said on the previous two occasions, she's, uh, had, she's had the amazing ability to weave together three careers uh, in her uh, very short life thus far. Uh, so not only a, an established scholar in a very particular field and not only a big uh, promoter of and, um, and, contributing, and contributor to the classical Christian school movement, but um, she's also somebody who's become something of a, a public intellectual, a sort of a Christian cultural critic, uh, you might say. Uh, and her, uh, her written work has been featured in such popular publications and websites as the Gospel Coalition, the Imaginative Conservative, Law and Liberty, and Public Discourse. Uh, and for, it's for this kind of work in these uh, popular media, I think that she was uh, uh, awarded the 2017 Emerging Public Intellectual Award from Redeemer University in Canada. Uh, but then interestingly, uh, with, the, uh, with the arrival of the pandemic and, the, and when, with everything turning online, um, it seemed to be uh, the moment when this particular aspect of her, uh, her career and her portfolio really started to explode. So if you Google Jessica Hooten Wilson, or if you duck, duck, go Jessica Hooten Wilson, um, you will find an awful lot of YouTube videos and recorded Zoom conversations and blog posts and podcasts and things uh, featuring her. Uh, she, uh, she brought her own website online to accommodate and direct people to a lot of these things, but you can find her on YouTube, Substack, Twitter, and podcast galore. Uh, lots of different places where you can read uh, Dr. Wilson's thinking on all, all things um, uh, uh, cultural. Uh, and, and to me, to my mind, that's a good thing. Uh, I think, cause I think the more we can get of Dr. Jessica Hooten Wilson, the better, but it also uh, says something pretty significant about her that she's able on the one hand to speak to uh, highly academic, very narrowly focused, um, audiences, uh, about the things that they care about, but she's also able to speak to a much broader audience of folks, uh, about the things that they care about. And it's a very rare person who can do those things with, uh, equal, excellence. And I think Dr. Jessica Hooten Wilson is precisely that kind of person. So uh, the first two lectures in the series were on uh, how we can read literature to be more like Jesus and then how uh, we can learn from Flannery O'Connor to use our suffering uh, so that we might become more like Jesus. Our third lecture, the, uh, the lecture that you're here for now today, is on, uh, on the choice between the via contemplativa and the via activa, that is the contemplative life or the active life is two different paths by which we might follow Jesus. And so uh, I ask you to join me now in welcoming Dr. Jessica Hooten Wilson. Thank you, Scott. It has been such a privilege to get to be here on campus and get to know students and faculty and really get to understand what is close to your hearts. I want to begin by praying tonight, as I did in the previous two lectures, everything that we do is for the glory of God, and I think we ask his blessing on this time, um, even though he provides it even when we forget to ask. Mm -hmm. And I want to start with Psalm 119 as the way of praying. I'm using the message translation, and if you're unfamiliar with the message translation, it was done by Eugene Peterson, and one of the reasons I appreciate this translation 
is it returns us to kind of the common speech or um, the vulgar tongue as the Bible was originally written or the New Testament was written in, in the Koine Greek. And there was a move by the apostles to really reach out to people. And what they found, if you, you know, if you go and look into this stuff more, you'll find that a lot of the apostles were writing in the language of the people in a way that they would write their grocery list in that same kind of Koine Greek, right? They were writing in very accessible language in the New Testament. And so Eugene Peterson as a pastor was trying to get back to that in the style that he translated the Bible. So it doesn't have a lot of the majesty and poetry of the King James, which I think is lovely and has a place and has had such a beautiful influence on a lot of literature. So you're not going to get me to turn away from the King James, but I do feel like there's different places for different kinds of discourse. Um, Dr. Crawford might appreciate this. George Herbert has a poem in which he's wrestling with poetic discourse and its role. And one of the things he, he says at the end of Jordan 1 is, um, and don't correct me if it's wrong, just pretend it's right. Um, Shepherds are honest men, let them sing, who plainly say, my God, my King. So there is a place for kind of this vulgar or common way of approaching God through our own speech as though we're just talking to someone we love and we know. So I'm going to use Peterson's uh, translation of the message, Psalm 119, to pray. So if you could bow with me and we'll, we'll use this psalm as a prayer. God, you prescribed the right way to live. Now you expect us to live it. Oh, that my steps might be steady, keeping to the course you set. Then I'd never have any regrets in comparing my life with your counsel. I thank you for speaking straight from your heart. I learn the pattern of your righteous ways. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Don't ever walk off and leave me. Be generous with me, and I'll live a full life. Not for a minute will I take my eyes off your road. Open my eyes so I can see what you show me of your miracle wonders. Help me understand these things inside and out so I can ponder your miracle wonders. My sad life's dilapidated, a falling down barn. Build me up again by your word. Barricade the road that goes nowhere. Grace me with your revelation clearly. I choose the true road to somewhere. I post your road signs at every curve and corner. I grasp and cling to whatever you tell me. God, don't let me down. I'll run the course you lay out for me if you just show me how. In Christ's name, amen. So over and over again in the biblical story, you hear the prophets warning the people not to close off their ears or close their eyes to what God is doing. And Peterson actually translates this verse in which Jesus says, God blessed eyes, eyes that see, and God blessed ears, ears that hear, in that famous passage in which Jesus has just told the parable of the seeds. What does it mean to not just have eyes that hear, and, uh, and sorry, eyes that see and ears that hear, but God blessed eyes, God blessed ears that would be open to his words and open to his work after Jesus tells this parable, he asks his disciples, are you listening? Are you really listening? And rather than leave them in a state of perplexity, he unpacks the story of the parable of the seeds for them. He teaches them then how to see and how to hear. This being ability to see the way God sees was often referred to as contemplation in the church tradition. Now, when we think of the word contemplation, Right, we might imagine like a yogi on a rug or something. I, I want to get away from that idea of contemplation and return us maybe to an idea of contemplation that's much more communal, that's less isolated, one in which the contemplatives are not just floating in Dante's seventh heaven, though I will refer to Dante a little bit, but one in which Peterson defines contemplation in this way. It means submitting to biblical revelation as a way of being Christian seers. He says that contemplation is taking biblical revelation within ourselves and living it unpretentiously without fanfare. Again, to quote Peterson, who's very helpful on this, contemplation means to live what we read, not wasting any of it or hoarding any of it, but using it 
by living. So after we read scriptures, what that means is we see everything else through that lens. We see other people through that lens. We see books through that lens. We see ourselves through that lens. We understand God through his revelation. We become these beholders who contemplate what it is that we see. So through the eyes of the word, we then read everything else. Let me show you two different ways of seeing so you can start to understand what I mean. We have a modern way of seeing, or maybe a way that we see according to the world without realizing it. Lewis is, you know, again, patron saint of all Protestants. Um, C.S. Lewis writes this great novel called That Hideous Strength. And in it, he contrasts this maybe modernist, utilitarian, consumerist way of approaching the world that we become accustomed to without realizing it with this contemplative imagination, a way of seeing through the biblical lens, a way of seeing the way God sees. He sets his novel at a college that he says in the beginning is not Oxford. And of course, by saying it's not Oxford, it's Oxford. <laughs> And it's called Bracton College, and they're discussing whether to sell part of their property. Now, for those who are faculty, you can instantly get into this mode of being in a faculty meeting, right? Where it's contentious, and even if you would want to sell the wood, if the person next to you is someone you disagree with, and they want to sell the wood, then suddenly you don't want to sell the wood, right? Yeah. This kind of uh, divisive nature that can occur. And so what happens is that the faculty meeting is being led to all want to sell the wood in the way the faculty meeting is being done. It's leading them that direction so that by the time one of the leaders of the faculty meeting stands up, no one in the room even thinks they want the wood because it's been talked about in such a way that it's worthless, it's just a piece of property. It doesn't produce anything for the college, right? It's lost its utility in that room. So the bursar actually stands up and he holds up a map and he says, uh, the, we are deciding whether to sell the colored pink area on this map and I will pass this now around the table. So not even talking about it like it's a wood. It doesn't even have a name. It's no longer Bragdon Wood. It's this area colored pink on a map and they pass it around so that it's completely flat there's no senses it's been objectified it's been reduced and they can hand it around and discuss whether to sell this pink area on a map that's a reductionist view now in contrast to that only moments before we have our narrator who is presumably Lewis who actually takes us as readers through this wood it's a rather lengthy passage, but let me read to you his walk through the wood, and you'll get a sense of the, the contemplative view that he's trying to move his readers towards, away from the reductionistic view. He describes himself walking up to a high wall that encloses the wood, and he says, when you enter, so he talks to the reader, when you enter, you sense a gradual penetration of the holy of holies. The narrator's inviting you to join him on this journey. He says, first you walk through the Newton Quadrangle, which is dry and gravelly. Florid but beautiful Gregorian buildings look down upon you. Next, you enter a cool, like tunnel passage, nearly dark at midday, and it bears a whiff of the smell of fresh bread. The grass here looks very green after the aridity of the Newton Quadrangle, and the very stone of the buttresses that rise from it gives the impression of being soft and alive. Chapel is not far off. The hoarse, heavy noise of the works of a great and old clock come to you from somewhere overhead. You are in a sweet Protestant world. You found yourself perhaps thinking of Bunyan or Walton's lives. And now he switches to his own perspective. As I went forward over the quiet turf, I had the sense of being received. The trees were just so apart that one saw uninterrupted foliage in the distance, but the place where you stood always seemed to be a clearing surrounded by a world of shadows. There you walked in mild sunshine. Do you see the contrast between these two ways of seeing, right? What we might call at this point two ways of imagining two ways of being in the world. In one, you have the smell of bread, the sound of the chapel, the light and dark, the trees, the feeling that the buildings almost take on personalities. It's an enchanted view of things. 
And our souls are evoked by this perspective. We're beholding it. And we want to behold it. We desire it. We might even say we love it. Joseph Pieper advises us that we keep the visual noise of daily inanities at a distance, right, in order to not distract us from this contemplation. Now, how do we do that? How do we keep these visual noises away from us so that we can become beholders, so that we can be contemplatives? Joseph Pieper's writing this in 1988, saying that there's visual distractions everywhere. In 1988. How much more so in 2021? He asked the question, how can we be saved from becoming a totally passive consumer of mass-produced goods? How can we be saved from being a subservient follower beholden to every slogan the managers may proclaim? The question, Pieper asks, is how can we preserve and safeguard the foundation of our spiritual dimension, our contemplative gaze? Pieper is talking about this visual objective to see things in order to grasp the totality of existing things, right? All of our senses turned on to the totality of the world around us. He's also including the oral training. He's drawing in this sense from C.S. Lewis, who said the only thing missing in hell is music and silence. Imagine that. Only music and silence are missing in hell. So con contemplation means not only seeing in a certain way, but being in tune with what many would call in the ancient world the music of the spheres. Right? Pythagoras thought the moon and sun and earth, they actually omitted their own hums to them. And, and then drawing on these ideas, we have Kepler writing in the harmony of the world that this inaudible music may actually be perceived by the soul and imitated in our human music. And so Pieper writes on this and Only the Lover Sings. He says that music may also form us into contemplatives who behold and praise the visible and the invisible alike. He writes, in this existential depth of the listener, far below the level of expressible judgment, there echoes the same vibration articulated in the uh, inaudible music, right? That we're echoing in our souls. That's another way of being contemplative. So how do we attune ourselves to the world's song? So here I want to turn to Tolkien, another beloved figure in uh, Christian imagination. In Tolkien, both Lewis and Tolkien talked about the world being created by music. Right? So in the creation of Middle Earth, you have God, um, who's actually creating these angelic beings, right? the Ainur, who sing his thoughts into existence. I'm going to read this passage, because again, you're going to get this contemplative vision, but it's a contemplative way of hearing or listening, right? having the God-blessed ears. The voices of the Ainur, like harps and lutes and pipes and trumpets and viols and organs, and like unto countless choirs singing with words, began to fashion the theme of God to a great music. And a sound arose of endless interchanging melodies woven in harmony that passed beyond hearing into the depths and into the heights. And the places of the dwelling of God were filled to overflowing. And the music and the echo of the music went out into the void, and it was no longer void. Although there's various singers, their voices all weave to become one, and their songs are endless and connected and countless, like the infinite variety of things that we even see in our creation. So by depicting creation as fashioned by song, Tolkien is highlighting this creativity of his creator. In words filled to overflowing, Tolkien stresses the abundance of this music, and the gratuitousness of the song then points to God's grace. How different eyes or ears it takes to hear that, Lewis somewhat copied this, if you've read In the Magician's Nephew. Remember, they're in a reading group and they're sharing their ideas, and Tolkien doesn't publish his ideas until after Lewis has died. So Lewis is hearing his friend's ideas and then writing The Magician's Nephew. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this similar scene where out of the darkness, right, Narnia is being created, a voice begins to sing. How many of you? Remember this, nodding heads, right? It begins at one voice and there becomes more voices than you can possibly count that are in harmony. And they're far higher up the scale, cold, silvery voices, and they're accompanied by the creation of the stars until the human observers feel certain the stars themselves are singing. And in response to this beautiful song and how it reflects creation, you have the cabbie, right? Who looks at it and says, Glory be, I'd have been a better man if I knew there were things like this, right? 
And of course, that's the irony that there are things like this. If only we saw our world that way. If only we were in tune to how creation is that way with this diversity of voices. For many years, I think that we've misunderstood this relationship between seeing this way and then how we respond in our lives. How do we go about knowing the word of God and it transforming how we read the world? How do we move from reading Revelation and then seeing with God's eyes the world that we inhabit as enchanted, as beautiful, as lovely, as something to contemplate and attend to fully? Simone Weil talks about attention at a certain level is like the practice of prayer. It's preparing you for prayer because when you attend to something, you can actually experience kenosis, right? You can experience this um, selflessness when you give yourself fully to what's in front of you. Think about conversations that you've had with people where you're talking to someone and it's different if their eyes are darting, like who else is in the room? Who else could I be talking to right now? Or their eyes just seem unfocused, like they're imagining what they're gonna have for dinner instead of actually paying attention to you, right? You've had this experience. Now imagine instead someone who is so attentive, they're hanging on your words. They're really listening. Imagine if we had that kind of attention before God ready to hear what he has to say, ready to see what he's going to highlight for us. And so they says, if you practice that kind of attention with what you read, with what you study, she's really, she writes this whole letter to students about practicing that form of attention that opens you up for the ability to pray, that that kind of prayer will transform your ability to, to attend and see in the world. How much more would you be able to practice loving your neighbors if you really saw them and you really listened to them and you were able to practice that self-emptying before them? In this way, I think we start to see the connection between contemplation and action. But I want to draw it out further because for a long time in our churches, we've really divided them. The active life versus the contemplative life as though they're two different ways of being in the world. Some people might say this goes back to Aristotle who prizes the life of the mind over the worker, right? That contemplation is the best end because it's sufficient in and of itself. And so we make contemplation separate totally from action where it's not in the Christian worldview, right? It might be for Aristotle, but it's not for Christians. I think we see this in the Diary of a Country Priest, which you, if you haven't read, I'm not gonna go too much into the plot, so don't feel like you have to have read the novel to know what I'm talking about. But in the Diary of a Country Priest, you see actually a symbiotic relationship occur between the active and contemplative life that I think overcomes this binary we created. Bernanos, the author, writes, he thinks the contemplative and active life should be intertwined. He said, other Christian mystics have expressed the same thought. The Martha and the Mary, we'll talk about that, must work together in the cooperative benefit of all. We must learn to see these two ways of being, the active and the contemplative, as in harmony. In the contemporary church, when we separate the two, we think instead of terms of, I'm a Martha or I'm a Mary. I'm a doer or I'm a thinker, right? I love social justice. I love studying doctrine. I'm a, I'm a fundamentalist, I do works of mercy, right? You see this kind of attitude in the church. But all the way back to the sixth century, Gregory the Great writes that breadth pertains to charity for the neighbor, right? Going, going widely. And then height is to the understanding of the maker. So the soul enlarges itself in width through love and lifts itself in height through knowledge and it is high above itself as it extends outside of itself. Do you see the relationship between the two? Once you start imagining the relationship between the two, you should visualize something that's central to the faith. It's a cross. The cross brings together those things that seem contradictory into one, extending outward to neighbor and upward toward God, being those who are both contemplating the source of love and practicing that love to our neighbor, and then the practice of the love of our neighbor then extends back to the love of God. 
Now, in the scriptures, Jesus does call contemplation the higher end in that episode with Mary and Martha. So we should look at that for a second. While Martha's fretting over preparing the house for the disciples to visit, Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet and listening. And Jesus speaks about both women. He says, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but Mary has chosen what is best, and it will not be taken away from her. When Aquinas reads this passage later, he expounds upon it and he offers nine different reasons, Mm -hmm. (laughs) as you would expect Thomas Aquinas to do, that the contemplative life supersedes the active life, right? Including its internal nature, capacity for delight, leisure and rest, direction toward the divine and eternal. And although the words of the Lord are there, contemplation is best, right? It will not be taken from her. Right before this, Jesus has just given us the parable of the Good Samaritan which again is a praise for the active life. So it's not as simple as it might appear. Now in the novel that I'm speaking on, The Diary of a Country Priest, we see this confusion occurring among the people in the town about the relationship between the active and the contemplative life. There's a young priest and he's in a parish and he talks about it in a way that you might talk about a 21st century church. He says, my parishioners are bored stiff. (laughs) They seem like every other parish, they're bored by their own faith. They've lost, you know, that Christian high that you get when you go to camp, and they're just living without that sense of who God is, right? They're not practicing it. They're not loving God. They're not praying. They're just a very bored congregation, and he's trying to get through to them with how he lives and how he prays in that community. And his mentor, I guess we would call it, is called the Cure de Torsi. He is one who only prizes the active. So imagine this. It's like a boss. I want to see results right? Like it's fine that you enjoy prayer, but what's happening in your parish? Are people converting? Are people doing good deeds? I want to see it. And he even says, he says, I've got nothing against contemplatives. Each man to his job, they provide us with flowers and music, right? It's the small things they do that if you're eating dinner, the people who prepare the feast matter. The flowers and the music, it's great. It's a good addition to the church. But instead, the priest is recognizing the necessity between the two calls, that he could no more be active in his community if he didn't start with daily devotion and prayer than if all of his action would just be meaningless and fruitless if he tried, right? He doesn't want just the Christian high of the music and the flowers. He sees the Christian source of love as essential to what he's doing in his community. I think of... um, the book of Haggai, when I try to imagine this relationship between the two. Maybe that's a strange pairing, um, but it's always kind of stuck with me that, you know, the prophet is lamenting that the exiles have returned to Judah and they don't rebuild the temple. They start by rebuilding all of their own houses, but they don't rebuild the temple. And Haggai, speaking on behalf of the Lord Almighty, says, you have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. So we stir ourselves, in other words, in the church on, in a, to a frenzy, right? All this activity on behalf of God. But does it bear fruit without beginning in worship, in the love of God? The exiles needed to rebuild the temple, not because God needed a house, but because the place of worship belonged in the center part of their lives. Without that source of life, what is the point of all their activity? All the other works become meaningless without the maker of meaning. So in the diary of the country priest, this young contemplative is actually very active in his community, and his action is stirred by his prayers. When the priest visits this great madame in town, we get to see how this plays out. She tells him, I've never failed in a single duty. Sometimes I've even found happiness. Right? What more can God ask of her? She's done all the right things. She's gone to church. She gives her alms. She raises her family. Her reputation is beyond compare. And yet he rebukes her. You may bid Christ welcome, he says, but what do you do when he comes? He was also welcomed by Caiaphas. As an aristocrat in the town, the woman is accustomed, unaccustomed to hearing the truth being spoken to her so harshly. And the priest is implying she's a murderer of Christ. Although others in the town believe in the Madame's charade of faith, this priest, he says that her pious standing is little more than a silk shroud on a rotting corpse. 
the two of them are talking privately in her home, and he is playing the role both as father, as priest, but also as child before her. It is both authority and humility. And as they talk, he realizes that she lost her son when her son was not yet two years old. And although this happened many years ago, she stopped loving God at that moment. From that moment on, she only committed acts of Christian duty, but she refuses to actually pray. Now, when Joseph Pieper has defined contemplation for us as a knowing that is inspired by love and without love there is no contemplation, we realize in turn that this woman, for all of her acts, is lacking that which help, would help her love God. The priest sees through this disguise and he credits God with his ability to speak honestly to her. And he confesses in his diary, while I struggled with all my might against doubt and terror, a spirit of prayer came to my heart. Let me put it quite clearly, he writes, from the start of this interview, I never once ceased to pray, in which shallow Christians use that word. A wretched creature into which air is being pumped may look like it was breathing, that's nothing. Then air suddenly whistles through the lungs and inflates each separate delicate tissue that is shriveled and the arteries throb to a violent influx of new blood and the whole being is like a ship creaking under swollen sails. He's given life by prayer in this moment and the prayer that he has practiced for so long is turning into action in his conversation with this woman. When St. Augustine is writing about how our longing for God, right, that emptiness, that desire for God actually increases our capacity for knowing God, he's talking about that sense the more we pray because we desire God to be here, that prayer reforms us. The praying is acting like a weightlifting, right? Um, as I was talking with the students this week, you begin with small prayers that feel like they're doing nothing, five pounds and then you do 10, and then you do 20, and you are actually increasing your ability to pray by practicing it more and more. And the priest is acknowledging the mystical intercession in this encounter with the madame. He says words were trivial at that moment. I feel as though a mysterious hand had struck a breach and who knows what invisible rampart so that peace flowed in from every side. He's recognizing his weakness and humility before her. And several times in the encounter, even the madame is expressing her shock, right? Here's this young man, 30 years younger than her, and he's speaking directly to her heart. He knows all the right words to say. Surely you've felt this, right? You have these encounters with people, and sometimes their suffering is so great you don't know what to say, and maybe you say the wrong thing at the wrong time. And then in other moments, you're talking with someone and their suffering is so great and you feel as though God gave you the words to say that you don't even know where they came from. Have you had that feeling? It's like, wow, I would have not known that person needed to hear that at that exact moment. And that's what the priest realizes, that he is able to speak on behalf of the spirit into her life. She thinks he's quoting from some book. There's no way he has access to that kind of wisdom. By the end of the scene, the priest tells the madame she must pray our father. And as a woman who has lost her son, she doesn't want to pray our father. Because surely our father wouldn't have taken her son from her. And yet this peace that, inter that flows from nowhere is granted to her. And she's able to pray for the first time in 20 years, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it is a prayer that frees her from the burden of hate that she was experiencing for so many decades, this lack of peace. And she's able to pray. And the priest reflecting on this moment says what I think is the best line in the whole book. Sweet miracle that we may give with empty hands what we ourselves do not possess. He recognizes by being open in prayer, he was always ready to act by God's grace. Kathleen Norris, when she talks about 
contemplation. She talks about it in terms of what's quotidian, right? What's normal? Where in our lives are we experiencing contemplation in our daily realities? And she says that those who contemplate holiness in isolation, reaching God-like illumination and serene silence, um, are not as significant to her for those who manage to find God in that life filled with noise where the demands of other people and the relentless daily duties that consume the self are everywhere. That the things in your life, to be a contemplative in this daily existence, right, rather than to retreat to be a contemplative, right, it's tied to an action within a community. And this kind of contemplation should remind us of the givenness, of the grace of life. We cannot then fix all the problems you know, this priest says, I'm no more than an instrument in God's hands. We cannot desire the good of God without his movement within us. Our ability to participate in others' lives is entirely dependent on contemplating the God who is love, who is the source of our love. Again, to quote George Herbert, who is one of my favorite poets, when he reflects on the vocation of a preacher, his call to love his congregation, he questions, Lord, how can man preach thy etern eternal word? He is a brittle, crazy glass. Yet in thy temple thou dost him afford to be a window through thy grace. What he means, crazy here meaning broken. How can a preacher say anything to a group of people, not knowing each of their situations, not knowing what they need to hear, especially for he himself is just nothing but broken glass. And yet, by God's light, by his grace, we become what we are meant to be. The Christian life then requires a vision that sees ourselves as sinners, broken glass, called to be saint, stained glass windows. And that's why churches are not filled with mirrors. They're filled with stained glass because the light of God then shines through those images of the church showing us who we are called to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Uh, lots to contemplate there. <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, we now have got some time for question and answer, and uh, we've set up two mics in the two aisles here, so if you have a question, please uh, make your way to one of the microphones um, so that that way uh, we can make sure that everybody can hear as well as the, the folks online. So please, whatever questions you have. Hey, Dr. Wilson, thank you so much. That was uh, really fantastic. One of the things that I was kind of wondering, though, is what are some better ways we can foster the contemplative part of our lives? Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any practical or anything like that. Yeah, I skipped a few pages in my talk because I wasn't sure whether to go there or not. Um, but one of the things that there's this guy, literally he calls himself guy number two, Guido number two, um, in the 12th century, this is a Carthusian monk, and he said, you know, contemplation's like way up here. How do you get there? And he has this vision of a ladder for how you get there. And he says it begins with lectio, meditatio is next rung, and oratio is the next rung, so by the time you get to contemplatio, right? So lectio being reading, reading the word, then meditating on the word. What does it mean? What do these things signify? right, um, and ruminating over the word, and then oratio, praying the Psalms, like, which is why I started with that. And then it leads you to contemplation. And one of the things that he notes in this account of like how to be a contemplative is that it is a constant cycle up and down the letter. So imagine Jacob in that scene where the ladder comes down to earth, the angels are ascending and descending. So you don't just rise to contemplation and end there, you will, in the beatific vision, you will, you know, after this life. But in this life, we're constantly going up and down the ladder. So we have to read every single day. We have to meditate every single day. We have to pray every single day to be able to foster that kind of contemplative life. Um, so it's a constant reading in the word, meditating on the word, praying the word, and it goes up and down. Thank you. Yeah.
You know, you made a little joke about the yogi uh, at the beginning of your talk, but I do suspect that when you're talking about meditatio, mm -hmm. that there could be some, particularly in evangelical contexts, who might get a little nervous. Yeah. That that the Vita Contemplativa sounds a bit too new agey, mm -hmm. or you know that the term you know, the term you're meditating on the word, they might get some anxiety about that. Mm -hmm. How? Would you propose we step back that anxiety uh, about uh, that, that kind of discourse? Yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons I, w I really appreciate Peterson being such a, an evangelical, giving the definition of contemplation that he does, that contemplation is just seeing with God-blessed eyes, right? It's trying to invite a different vision than you yourself possess by yourself, right? It's being so rooted in the word, you can't see, you see everything else by the word. Right, this constant sense, and and that does take practice. So um, the reason this and this is Carthusian monk, his day would have been the word of God all day long. He would have been hearing it being read aloud because they didn't read silently. Right, he would have been singing it in his heart. Imagine for a second. I'm going to mostly address students, but I think professors deal with this too. You have songs that get in your head, and you can't get them out. Right? This happens. Imagine if the song in your head was the word of God. And that day and night, when it says meditate on the word day and night, you didn't, it wasn't some effort that you made. But because you were so invested and saturated in the word of God, it was the song running through your head. It was so memorized and internalized in your being that it came out when you were talking and thinking and in conversation and in what you were doing because you so knew it, you knew it by heart, right? So the Old Testament, when it talks constantly about like write it on your hands, write it on your door frame, they didn't mean like Hobby Lobby posters, right? Uh -huh. Like it, it meant to like constantly have it available within your core so that it just came out at the dinner table. It just came out when you were talking. That's what it was talking about making sure you knew the word. So for evangelical Christians, I think we're turning first to reading the word of God. Now, as a literature professor, I believe literature becomes a secondary resource to gloss the Bible and to help illustrate the way that scripture can be lived out. And therefore, it becomes an even more memorable part of your existence the more you're reading literature. It can also lead you to those same kinds of eyes. But that's all in the scandal of holiness for how that does that and why that does that. Um, but that's the argument that I'm trying to make. If we want to know the Bible, reading literature can actually be um, a help to reading the Bible. It gives you practice reading the Bible. So you should all be literature majors. <laughs> but these are really great questions. And if you want to challenge me on that, I love challenge. It's awesome. You're not going to challenge me on being a literature no, major, Dr. Kraft. I would never challenge <laughs> that suggestion. Um, I'm still, uh, my imagination still resonating with that passage you read from that hideous strength. Yeah. Um, uh, about that wood and the way that narrator is received into mm -hmm. it and, and what that enables. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about spaces. Yeah. And uh, how we can cultivate spaces as individuals in our lives that where we yes. can be received into contemplation, but also as communities and maybe even as a university community, what role might spaces play in that cultivation? That's fantastic. So Dr. Hewlin mentioned that I do a lot with classical education. So I have a different form of this talk in which I actually only talk to classrooms about how to create contemplation in classrooms. So one of the things is, if you look just at classrooms, are they the kind of space that invite beholding? And that's the way we should really view contemplation. It's not something ethereal. It's not floating off into space. It's very much about this world, but directing your gaze through this world to the things that last, right? So you're seeing these glimpses of eternity and the particularities around you. That's what the contemplative, you're beholding something. Right? Um, Gerard Manley Hopkins, right? Uh, These things all here and but the beholder wanting, right? That's, that's the call, is to become a beholder. And so is the space that you're in inviting you to become a beholder or is it challenging you to do that? It causes more distraction. 
Have you created a space in your life that is causing more visual or oral noise? Or is freeing you from those things to be able to behold the things that matter? Does that make sense? Um, so in our house, for example, um, we recently bought a television set upstairs. It doesn't connect to actual TV, it's just a monitor um, that we can like plug this little thing into and watch things. <laughs> but we don't have downstairs, we have no space for that. There is no noise in, well, I have three children, there's tons of noise, but <laughs> there's no um, screen noise in my downstairs, right? Um, it is a space that invites beholding. It invites contemplation. That was the goal, right? Um, we wanted the home to look like that, and we wanted the dinner table to be part of that. Um, this space for people to, to breathe and to think and to love. And I think also in, um, I know I was just at Augustine School where they were talking about being outside a lot and having that kind of connection with the outdoors. I think that's another part of it. Uh, really knowing the seasons, knowing the weather. Andy Crouch talks about how um, before he even turns on his phone, he walks outside, like even if it's for just a second, and he gets a sense of where he is, what it feels like, what it smells like, what it sounds like. He turns on his senses before he turns them off if he has to do work, right? He's always making sure that that's how he's imprinted, that's how he's in touch with who he is, first and foremost. And he says he does this even when he goes to hotels, even when he travels, which I think is like a big ask because I'm not gonna go down six floors and like go outside when I travel at these hotels. But at the same time, the default I think should be to know your seasons, to know your world. Um, how, how much during a week do you feel your feet on the ground, right? Um, how much during the world are you looking around you? Do you even, are you aware of where you are? And I think it's important. So I think it does take a lot of retraining and a lot of habits as well as, as the space of being in touch with those senses. It's another reason for poetry, right? Just having poetry invites you to think and smell and hear things that way um, in a way that screens, again, I love good movies, but in a way that movies don't or screen time does not invite that kind of all five senses turned on. We have a lot of brave people. It just takes you can just line up if you want to. So, so uh, I was going to ask about um, throughout history, there have been several Christian communities that have failed as a whole to, I guess, see the truth. Mm. Um, a couple situations I can think of are Christian Crusades, mm. uh, Christian community in the Nazi Third Reich, and probably Southern Baptist during enslavement. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do entire communities where there is praying and thoughtful understanding, yet mm -hmm. they still miss the ball, how do they yeah. stop themselves from doing that? Oh, that's fantastic. So the, the book I'm currently re writing is called Reading for the Love of God. Because one of the things that comes up when you look at the church tradition is the fact that the church becomes so much like the world in lots of different ways. And the way that that happens is, especially if you think books are salvific, right? So one of the things I just said at the Augustine School, my whole talk started with reading will not save you, right? Um, it's not gonna make a bad person into a good person. Not even reading the Bible is going to necessarily make a bad person into a good person. But reading with piety, beginning with humility. So there's certain virtues throughout the church, especially the early church fathers and mothers would write about the necessity of having these virtues when you approach the text. Because if not, you were gonna make the text say whatever you wanted it to say, right? So if you, for example, if you read Frederick Douglass on um, his approach to scriptures during that time, he was very concerned with a lot of the modern German biblical criticism that was abstracting Jesus to make points. And that's what a lot of the um, anti-abolitionists were doing, were cutting out Bible verses, putting them by themselves, reading them out of context, reading them to suit their own interest. So there wasn't that kenosis, there wasn't that self-emptying before the text to receive what it says and then let it judge you. Because the Bible should judge you. Um, Flannery O'Connor said, self-knowledge begins when you judge yourself by the truth versus judging the truth by yourself, right? If you judge the truth according to you, you're going to, right, see all these faults in it. 
you don't want like what it has to say, you're going to change and modify it. If you're judged by it, it can be convicting and become very problematic. And so even during, for example, the Third Reich, there were so many believers who did that, like Bonhoeffer, right, um, who during that time refused to bow down to the Nazis, refused their place in society because of what they were reading scripture. But the remnant is always going to be few. It's not going to be massive, right? We're even told that in the scriptures, that it'll be those who follow Jesus that is a very small group. Um, and even those who said that they knew him, he will say, I knew you not by how you act, right? Um, or if you're acting a certain way to be a believer, but you don't actually love him, he will say, I know you not. And that's why this connection between the contemplative, this self-emptying, as well as the acts are so necessary and go together. That was a great question. I feel the need to ask a nerdy Flannery O'Connor question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always feel that need, so that's nothing new, right? My the students need are or like, what? Yeah, okay. yeah, right, right, exactly. So um, I too am thinking about the uh, the passage about uh, Braddock Wood. Is that the name of it? Braddock? Bra uh, Bracton College, Bracton, Bracton Wood. Bracton Wood, that's right. I, so I'm, I'm also thinking about the passage about Bracton Wood. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about how it parallels a certain passage in uh, The Violent Barrett Away, Flannery O'Connor's second novel, where. Um, Raber and um, and his nephew are walking through a wood, and the narrator tells us that uh, uh, all of a sudden I've lost the nephew's name. Help me, Francis Marion. Oh, no, uh, no, oh, no. This is when Old Hotter Water, Old Hotter Water yes. is walking with Raber, his nephew. Oh, is that it? Maybe it is. But at any rate, uh, the point is that uh, Old Tar Water looks up in, uh, in these trees. They're walking through a forest, and he walks up the, through these pine trees, mm -hmm. and he sees a cathedral. Uh, but Raber instead is actually calculating how many board feet of yes, lumber this yeah. uh, this one would produce. And so what this makes me wonder, and I've often wondered this, um, Lewis and O'Connor overlapped. Mm -hmm. Do we have any reason to think that they knew one another's work? Um, not vice versa. Not vice versa. Um, O'Connor read Lewis. Really? So she was even reading miracles uh, in the hospital during the last year of her life. No. Yeah. So so she and she loved letters to Malcolm. Um, so O'Connor loved Lewis, but I don't know if Lewis ever knew O'Connor because I'm not a Lewis scholar. Yeah, but I'm more I'm just not. an aficionado about Lewis. <laughs> right. No, I'm the same way, uh, but I haven't run across anything that convinced me. But the but the striking parallel there made mm -hmm. me wonder whether there was, you know, some common source or whether they were leaning on each other. Uh, yeah. Well, especially I mean the the invitation to imagine differently is also the invitation of all artists, right? Sure. So Jacques Maritain, like any of these artists that yeah. are writing about art and how it gets you to see differently, right? Um, so the more that we abstract art from our lives, right, and especially, I, I'm going to say this because I'm at a Christian university, the more that Christian universities cut the arts from their curriculum, they're actually leading students to see more like the consumer reductionistic um, condescending, judgmental way of viewing the world rather than the artist who it is supposed to humble themselves, who is supposed to practice sight, who is supposed to receive. Um, there's just two different ways of being. And um, I think it's Brueggemann who talks about um, the necessity of the poets and the prophets yeah, right. as the same kind of visionaries who can see in this current world and can also see the ought, can see the future, right, with the eyes of the past looking forward instead of the consumer or only the current or to be lost in what Alan Jacobs calls presentism, right? To be so blinded by the presentism that you mm. miss out um, on those ways of viewing that open you up to eternity. That's yeah. great. Thank you so much. That's yeah. a, that is a needed word. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question or comment. If there is not, I am speaking again at seven, so I'm happy to take those questions. Um, or if microphones scare you, you're welcome mm -hmm. to come up to me afterwards because mm -hmm. I really enjoy conversation. Well, let's uh, thank Dr. Wilson one more time, please. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for uh, being here. I just want to make uh, two quick reminders, or three quick reminders, one of which Dr. Wilson already made. 
So her fourth and final lecture will be uh, this evening at 7 p.m. And this time she'll be inviting us to think about um, the Ars Moriendi, or uh, the art of dying well. In this particular case, uh, how do we as Christians learn how to die like Jesus? Um, and that's, uh, that's, of course, not inviting you to go put yourself on a literal cross somewhere, but, right, but hopefully you understand. Um, secondly, uh, if you are interested in the book, um, which is the source for these uh, lectures today, you can see we have copies of it over there on the table uh, that will be available for sale after the, uh, after the evening lecture tonight. Uh, they're not available online. You can't get it from Amazon, and you can get it for $5 cheaper here than you'll be able to get it from Amazon in a couple of weeks. So make sure you go ahead and get it before the cost goes up. Um, and then finally, uh, Dr. Wilson will be, uh, has graciously agreed to be available to sign copies of the book uh, for anyone who purchases one. So uh, if you're interested in a, in a signed copy of the book, uh, please uh, stick around after the uh, lecture this evening. Um, thanks again uh, to all the folks online uh, who, who attended. And I uh, also want to make a quick reference to any uh, classical Christian educators who might be in the room or be online that we're offering a couple of opportunities this summer for uh, deepening your knowledge of two great works of classical um, antiquity, uh, Virgil's Aeneid and Plato's Republic. And if you want more information on those, uh, go to uu.edu slash honors. So thanks every, uh, again, uh, everyone, for being here. And I uh, hope to see you again this evening at 7 p.m. right here in this room.